Hi, and thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us again today for another Extreme Performance Series video blog edition. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about latency sensitive workloads in real time applications. And when we're talking about stuff like that, we have to bring one of our gurus in. And so today, joining me, we have Richard Liu, uh, who is one of the scheduler folks that we lean on all the time. So, Richard, why don't you give yourself a quick introduction? Thanks a lot, Mark. Hi, guys. My name is Richard Liu. I work primarily on ESX resource management, focused on CPU. Pure scheduler, Numa, Numa scheduler, and memory management. Uh, recently, I've been spending a lot of time trying to make ESX run real-time applications better. And so, in, what are kind of this? What's this real-time category? You know, give us a couple of examples so people understand what it might be. Right. So, if we think about low latency features um, that we have right now, it's a feature designed for something like virtual network functions or network intensive traffic. But there's a category of applications that we have been sort of focusing on that is kind of the telco radio access network applications or application that has really, really stringent tail latency responsiveness requirement. For example, for networking applications, we're typically talking about 99.9 .9 or 99.29 percentile of latency performance, which we're very good at for the current low latency offering that we have. But there also is another set of applications which focuses on 99.39, 4959, even 69 tail latency, or even max tail latency across 24 hour duration. Those applications that we're, which is what we are focused on in the current release for the next generation of low latency feature. So kind of the idea here is let's continue to capture new application space, new application categories, right? So these are things that people traditionally have said we could not do, right? So we have latency sensitivity as a feature, but as you kind of just highlighted with the tails and the number of nines, um, it's important. So I, I hear that we've made some changes kind of for U3. And so where are we headed in that direction? Towards your point, Mark, a lot of these existing benchmarks or applications or business logic is typically hosted by bare metal systems with real-time Linux on top of it, right? One of our primary goal is to check and see if our performance is on par or uh, comparable to these traditional setups, which also is very powerful because it allows us to run these typically considered as real-time applications in a virtualized setup. So what kind of uh, data then do you have to kind of show us here? So I, I understand you got some experiments, right? People don't believe just us chatting. So what do we have for numbers to show? Uh, we're using one of the uh, most popular benchmarks that people typically uses to uh, test for tail latency. That's called cyclic test. What the benchmark does, it essentially measures performance or tail latency of a platform using physical timers, right? Here we have a bare metal measurement where we run the benchmark for a prolonged period of time. As you can see from the graph towards the left, we have an x-axis uh, denoting the samples of latency readings. We have y-axis denoting the number of samples hitting that latency reading in log scale. In the bottom, we have a summary where we plot out the average latency from this measurement, uh, as well as different percentile. As you can see here in this bare metal measurement, the average latency is around two microseconds where the tail latency is pretty flat. It ranges from three microseconds to max of six microseconds. This is a traditional kind of people talk about real time bare metal setup. The first thing we did is we start from our existing offering with low latency feature or latency sensitive VMs prior to similar U2. Remember I talked about the feature we have right now is mostly targeted for virtual network functions or network intensive benchmarks or workloads. Uh, we're not targeting for extreme tail latency performance. And that's kind of why we have a very different latency profile for ESX running a real-time VM um, that produces safety test samples. Now, as you can see here from the right-hand side, we have ESX running real-time Photon Guest, which is a real-time Linux with preempt RT patch. On top of that, we run safety test. We can see the average is sort of comparable. Uh, in bare metal, we have two microseconds. Average now we have four microseconds on ESX. Uh, we're pretty good at 99.9 .9 percentile and we're pretty okay with 99.29 percentile. But as we stretch out the tail, we can see the sample readings also becomes higher and higher compared to bare metal. So now, here's where people say we can't, we can't do it anymore, right? 
And so what did you discover as we kind of go through this? So first thing we have to do is understand where these tail latency are coming from. And for tail latency, it's actually coming from components such as VMCI or backdoor RQs, which can take a longer time to process when the VM is busy running application. So first thing we do is we get rid of them. So then the graph becomes something like this. As you can see, the longer tails are, are gone, but now we're left with this thick tail, which ranges from 20 to 70 microseconds. So one thing we realized is that the short tail or thick tail is actually a combination of many, many different components or different noise sources. Like one thing, for example, in the, in, is the MCE pull logic on ESX, which pulls error bank for uh, reliability concerns and check for errors, things like that. Plus a lot of other uh, uh, bookkeeping threads or bookkeeping work that's actually ongoing. So we have to get rid of them as well. And you too, we're able to get rid of both the, thin, the thick tail uh, or the short tail or the long and the long tail. And this is a graph we have for you too. As you can see, we have a much flatter tail response for you too, but we didn't stop there. So where did we go for U3? You're telling me you made this better? Yes, absolutely. So one thing we did want to understand is what are these tiny tails? And tiny tails is something that's actually getting a bit deeper into the virtualization stack. So to get rid of these tiny tails, we have to be really smart and you know creative about how we should re-engineer our platform. So with all these tiny tails removed, and here's what we actually was able to achieve in several U3 timeframe. As you can see here, it's much cleaner compared to U2 and the tail is much shorter. If you look at the summary below the graph, you can see here in the percentile uh, summary area, we are very much on par with spare metal. Now that's, in that's incredible. I mean, obviously there's been a lot of work to your point to evolve the platform, but you know, just taking a peek at that chart here too, I'm still looking at the average latency saying, well, one was two, Right, we're still at three for virtualization. So amazing, but you know, what about that last microsecond? Right, so that's a side effect of the thought itself. As I mentioned earlier, the secret test benchmark itself uses a timer to measure latency. Essentially what happens is you set an APIC timer, you get interrupt, you measure the date latency between the timer deadline and actual timer received. And that's the latency sample plot. And for bare metal, the timer APIC is much faster than virtualized timer. Essentially, we kind of have to, you know, go through the APIC emulation path and come back up. Now, but this is not really on the critical path of application. This is just a application or micro benchmark to sanity check the, uh, the readiness of the platform. So in order to present a more kind of realistic view of what a polling thread or what a real time thread actually you know, fails when it runs on ESX, we start another benchmark, which is uh, another open source benchmark on Linux, which is called OSLAT. The difference here is that instead of using timer to measure latency, this benchmark uses a busy loop without exiting or programming the hardware, mimicking a DVDK polling thread or mimicking a busy thread trying to process packet in a predictable manner. Same thing on the left hand side, we have a bare metal reading with the percentile in log scale. Now, for similar U3, it's very comparable to what we showed earlier with SIGIT tests. We have average, very comparable, right? And also in a tail, we're slightly longer compared to bare metal in similar U2 because of those tiny tails. With similar U3, we're able to, again, chop up these tail or tiny tails and make it very comparable to bare metal. As you can see, because of busy loop, it does not include a path of processing virtual APIC emulation, which is very similar to, and then this busy loop is very similar to what application actually will experience. And with this benchmark, we're able to show that we're essentially identical to bare metal performance. Any difference you see here is gonna be a run to run variation. No, there should be no concerns putting this, you know, vSphere underneath this, making sure that it's, it's our current version and like you said, pull things together. Um, I mean, that that's a huge stride for what a lot of people would say we couldn't do before. Well, that's awesome. And, but coming back kind of to that original point, right? So we've done a lot of work within the vSphere platform here to discover and optimize for that. Um, what did you kind of learn going through this whole process? Of course, 
if you think about application itself, especially real-time applications that we're targeting for with the Summer U3 release, it's really a factor or matter of the full stack. Right? The way to think about this is that a real-time from bottom up, real-time system from bottom up needs to be tuned from ground up. Hypervisor is a very important fundamental piece, but there are more to it. So the way I kind of think about this tuning for real-time workload on vSphere is that we have to start from the bottom layer, which is platform, which is the hardware, including BIOS, firmware configurations. You need to make sure that your system does not have random SMIs that can preempt the operating system from running. And again, at a given point in time, you need to make sure that the power settings are pretty much stick. And then to avoid kind of, uh, uh, I guess, back and forth and frequency tuning from the BIOS side. The second layer on top of the platform is, of course, our hypervisor. Summer U2 improved upon uh, the existing number, but Summer U3 pushed it really, really towards you know, the critical uh, performance tail latency numbers. And these are also offered as part of the lowering CVMs with additional settings on top of ESX. Then on top of that, you need to have a compatible real-time operating system as a guest, such as our Photon RT offering, which is now currently available from VMware distribution publicly. You can also pick and choose your favorite RT distribution for Linux to host your benchmark or application. The last and the most important part, of course, is the application itself, which is where the business logic exists. The application logic itself also needs to be mindful about how they're utilizing the underlying resources exactly the same way as how they have to be mined for a bare metal setup. So with these components put together, I think we'll be able to have a very good real-time workload presented on vSphere. Oh, well, that's awesome. I think that's important to, again, remember that complete picture uh, that we have to pull together these layers to be successful. And so, excellent. Uh, thank you, Richard, for being with us here today. Um, for those looking for some more information, there'll be some links below the video here as well for some white papers and some blog articles uh, related to this. Uh, but again, kind of that reminder that as Richard and his team of uh, fabulous folks grind away on that underneath, we shouldn't be afraid of going after and challenging and trying out these new applications and then reaching out to us as you guys may need, you know, some other interesting information or support around that. So thanks everybody for joining today. Thank you, Richard. And we'll look forward to the next edition of the Extreme Performance Series video blogs. Thanks, Mark. Thanks everyone.